I went low this time. I got creative. What do you think of that creativity? I liked it. I think it sounded good over the mic. Unfortunately, Arm Layton is not here with us. He could provide a lot of good insight to all the great questions that were asked on our Instagram and on our Twitter, but he wouldn't harmonize with us. So I'm not missing him that bad. Are you? Um, no, I never really miss him. Um, so <laughs> I'm kidding. I love him dearly. And uh, yeah, it would be great for him to uh, bring his, you know, excellent baseball knowledge to the table. But in terms of the curmudgeon behavior that is not joining along on the mailbag harmonizing, uh, we can certainly live without. I agree. And now you and I could just screw around. So we have seven questions again from our Instagram at just baseball show and yeah. on Twitter at just BB underscore media. We post the graphic on Thursday morning, get all the questions. We got tons. Thank you again. And all of this is brought to you by bet MGM, the King of sports books. Use promo code, just baseball. When you sign up and deposit into your newly created account, download the bet MGM sports app on iOS or Android, or visit BetMGM.com. Place your first bet offer and receive up to $1,000 back in bonus bets. If it loses, I made a mistake. 1500 how about that ladies and gentlemen if the bet does lose your bonus bets will be available once the wager is settled terms and conditions apply gambling problem call or text 1-800-GAMBLER and must be 21 or older go ahead quick thing before the mailbag um you have shower thoughts everybody has shower thoughts i had a shower thought this morning um i was thinking back for some reason to the lockout between 2021 and 22 I was like, damn, we did a lot of stuff during the lockout, which was great. Um, but then I remember the day that the lockout ended. I was like, what did that timeline look like? Because I remember AAA baseball started the day before big league baseball started. And I was like, I remember something really weird happened with Jeff Passan. And then I remembered he got hacked by that NFT thing on the lockout day. And I was like, I spent way too much time in the shower and I became a raisin because I was like, what is the name of that goddamn NFT? Is it touch tunes? No, I feel like that was a free MP3 thing that I used. Was it skull tunes? I think it was skull tunes. Do you remember? Of course I remember it happening. There's no shot. I would remember the name of the NFT. Your See, memory. I was trying is to remember the name of the NFT. It was a weird one. It wasn't a bored ape. Like it was, it was a bizarre skull i think it was skull tunes and i i really want to ask jeff passett if he ever figured out a way to like monetize that like hey did you get in touch with the people at skull tunes are there people behind skull tunes i don't know the thing is if he monetized it at the time he's probably down remember the craze of nfts bitcoin ethereum during covid when everybody thought to themselves well the economy is going to be in the trash so let's invest our money into bitcoin ethereum yeah. these tokens those are down now could they rebound of course just like a player having a bad season could they rebound of course i don't know if they will though i hope so yeah. i am invested and i am down yes um it is skull tunes it was jeff.eth parentheses jeff passon and this is what it looked like you remember for the youtube crowd it looked like that yeah, I just needed to find it. Skull Tunes, Jeff Dot ETH, Jeff Passon on the day the lockout ended. This is what happens when Arm is not on the show. Jack, I think we should get right into question one, and we're starting miserable. It's miserable being a Padres fan. Okay. What do you think they should do this offseason to get back on track for 2024 and beyond? Asked by J D O W S E9 on our Instagram. I'll throw it over to you first. Because the Padres are your favorite team. Not favorite, but I think the Padres kind of fit in that love-hate bucket for you. For me? Yes. I, okay, so I've had a chance to verbalize my thoughts or vocalize, verbalize, vocalize. I've had a chance to get my thoughts out on the Steel snell thing. And do I think that Steele's last start against the Pirates on Wednesday cost him the Cy Young? Yes, I do. I think it's Blake Snell's Cy Young. I think Am I happy about it? I think the start before that as well. And it, it might have back to back shutouts. Yeah, no, I mean, he's been great. Like seven. No, no earlier this week. Holy yeah. hell. Um, now, am I happy that Snell is going to win the Cy Young? Not really. Guy's gotten nine outs after the sixth inning. He yeah. leads the National League in walks issue. 
He has a lower ERA. Thanks to Foolish for putting this out. He's got a 2-2-3 ERA when walking four or more guys in an outing. He has a 2-4 when walking fewer than four guys. He's better when he walks more dudes. What? So I'm not happy about that. Um, but I ask you, Jay Douse, uh, is it really miserable? You guys have won seven in a row. That's what I was now, it is say. Too little, too late. It's is it too little too late? Is it? Because yes, it it's is. not like the other teams are pulling away, right? The Cubs just can't find a win right now. It's not like the Reds are playing that great of baseball. I know they had a good series against the Twins, but it's not. I, I'm looking at the meme. So you're saying there's a chance. No, no. They're not mathematically out of it. Yes, they're not mathematically out. And they, they have such have an with easy, nine games left. They have such an easy schedule moving forward. What I want you to do, go on that iPad of yours, but I don't think you have the iPad anymore. I want no, you to I've... go look for our listeners. I want you to go look at the remaining Padre schedule. And then what I want you to do is I want you to go look at the standings and tell me there isn't a chance. Well, Cole Reagans and Framber Valdez tomorrow is going to hit like an atom bomb. That's going to be so sick. Uh, you've got the fluttering knuckleball of Matt Waldron starting against Dakota Hudson at home. Uh, so that's Cardinals Padres this weekend. I'm not sure how I feel about that. It's going to be Waldron, Nick Martinez, Michael Waka. They get Drew Rahm on Sunday, so that's an auto dub. Can uh, you look and, at the schedule, please? Can you read off yes. the names? So it's a weekend set against St. Louis at home. Then it's three in San Francisco. And then San Diego. Where are you, San Diego Padres? Um, oh, they're in Chicago playing the White Sox. That's disgusting. Uh, that's how they finish. So it's home against St. Louis in San Francisco in Chicago. And San Francisco is playing like ass right now. They have run out of magic. Arizona just took two of two from them. Normally in those series, you see a division split there right i was the moron who bet on the san francisco giants with logan or logan webb guess what happened they lost seven to one it wasn't even close lamont wade jr starts the game off with a home run they proceeded to get two more hits after that they can beat the giants they can beat the cardinals and they can stomp all over the white Sox, who just got their teeth kicked in by the nationals hold on man davy garcia and luis patino are only allowing like a homer per inning so they're really on the come up um, the way that I kind of looked at this question, and that was a really good question um, that came to us on Instagram was, I, I don't think top end talent is the issue. And I don't think there's anything you can do with your top end talent to make it better. Like you can't add another $35 million player to this fold. You don't have the financial flexibility to do so. The way that I kind of view it is you can trade one of Ha Sung Kim or Juan Soto and kickstart this process, but they need way more depth. They need more starting pitching depth uh, because Darvish is getting old and he's hurt. Musgrove is hurt and he spent a lot of time unavailable over the last year and a half. Um, they need starting pitching depth, which they don't have in AAA, and they need bench bats, which they don't have in the big leagues and they don't have reinforcements in AAA. So while you can get excited about Merrill and Salas, those are everyday players. Like, I need the San Diego Padres to have serviceable non-everyday players, uh, and they just don't have that right now. Can Azokar turn into that? Sure. Can Aggie Rosario turn into that? Sure. But, like, Matthew Batten? We sure? Like, Carpenter? You want him again? You want to do that again next year? Um, I, I, I don't know, man. I, it's either sign a bunch of old farts to one or two year deals or trade Hassan Kim for four guys that can be on your bench. I have a take that I'm willing to get hurt for. Fine. I think the Padres are going to be one of the best teams in Major League Baseball next year. <laughs> the Angels, too. Don't forget about the Angels. No, they're fucked. I'm willing to get hurt on the San Diego Padres. And let me tell you why. So in 2022, the Miami Marlins were one of, if not the, worst team in major league baseball in one run games those type of things tend to regress year over year 
those really are luck type numbers, right? Sometimes the ball bounces your way. Sometimes it doesn't. The Padres in one run games were absolutely pitiful this year. Terrible. If I'm not mistaken, our Padres guy, Javier Reyes, said they were 6-22. and 22. I don't know if that's the exact record, but I think Padres fans understand that they were rarely on the right side of one-run games. I look at their team. Juan Soto still had a good year. Yep. Manny Machado is still good. Xander Bogarts was dealing with an injury all year. Haseon Kim is just straight up awesome. Cronenworth, I think, rebounds next year. And Fernando Tatis Jr. And we've seen what Luis Campusano has looked like at the catcher position. You're right. Musgrove has been hurt. Is he going to be hurt next year? Snell seems to have figured something out here. Yeah, but Snell's gone. Like, are the Padres going to pay him? They might. Like, I'm not counting anything out of AJ Fowler. If they don't get Snell, I think they are still going to get another starting pitcher. So I'm either assuming they bring back Blake Snell or they add a big-time starter. I think they're going to add to their bullpen, which was not healthy for the majority of this season. Yeah. Those type of things, those balls tend to bounce back. Now, the reason I say I'm willing to get hurt again is because all the rumors that we hear out of San Diego is that the clubhouse is an absolute mess, that these guys do not gel together. Now, if that never ends up happening... We're going to see the same things. It's going to be the same Padres team that when they're up, they show no urgency and they blow it. When they're down, talk about not showing urgency. They just want to get back to their hotel rooms. It's been that simple this year for the San Diego Padres. If they're able to gel this offseason, they're still led by a good manager. I don't care what anybody says. And I know he hasn't even been that good this year. But Bob Melvin is still a good manager. A.J. Preller is still an aggressive GM who will add now to the big league roster. I think the Padres had a season from hell this year, but they are still absolutely loaded with talent. They're wrapped into hundreds of millions of dollars, and they have no choice but to continue to go for it. I truly think the Padres, because we cannot forget this Padres team, lost to the Phillies, who then went to the World Series. They're a year removed from that. And they really have more players since then. This was a season from hell. I think they're going to bounce back and be one of baseball's best teams next year. So the question you're asking, what do you think they should do with this offseason to get back on track? I think you bring back Blake Snell and you run it back. I think they're going to be good, Jack. I do. I'm willing to hang my hat on it. Dude, like where is the flexibility though? That's my thing. You've got Snell and Hayter coming off the books. All right, that clears up. That clears up 30. But it like, let's go to 2026. They've got 25 and a half wrapped up in Xander Bogarts. I ain't worried about 2026. I'm worried about 2024. All right, let's look at 24. You got 25 on Bogarts. You got 20 on Musgrove. You got 17 on Machado, 16 on Darvish, 16 on Nick Martinez, 16 on Waka, 11 on Tatis, 10 on Suarez, seven and a half on Lugo if he opts in, seven and a half on Cronenworth, seven on King, on uh, Kim, five and a half on Carpenter. Do you realize how much fucking money I just read off here? But do you realize There's how many good Snell players? Money. Do you realize how many good players you just named? Okay, but I also named like you, Darvish, who's going to be 37 and coming off bone spurs in his elbow. I'm naming Joe Musgrove, who has missed more time this year than he has been on the field. Jake Cronenworth sucked before he got hurt. Like you are, you're betting on bounce backs. But the thing is, I, I just saw it. I just saw it last year. And these guys were hurt all year. I, but I saw never this year. one run games. So then if they're healthy, like what? Are we just going to assume they're all hurt again? Like, I don't think we can do that. What we have to do is look at the guys. Yes, they were hurt. Will they be hurt this year? I don't know. But if they aren't, they're still all really good players. Like everybody you name that's on payroll is good outside of Matt Carpenter. So if they let him go, they let him go. They're still, and let's say they Snell leaves and Josh Hader leaves. Okay, now you have $30 million. You can go get Yamamoto. I'm sure he would want to come over to California. Of course he would. Like, they are an aggressive team 
loaded with talent, ready to win now. Your fault. This is my hate coming out. I they piss me off because they have so much money tied up. I'm like, they can't pay Snell off a of Cy Young. And we you know what they're they gonna do? Bogart's two hundred and yeah. fucking exactly. ninety million. You know what they're gonna do? They're gonna pay Snell off a of Cy Young, and I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna eat shit on the podcast. Like that's just how I know this November is gonna go. We have to stop looking at them like with logic. They are just going to go for it and spend tons of money because Next. they see the returns when Petco Park sells out every single day. And they're making that money back because they're still, regardless of the suckage, one of the most exciting teams in baseball. They get a lot of eyes and they make that money back through different revenue streams. I think they're going to get Yamamoto now. Yeah, but how about the Padres being one of two teams in baseball that Bally didn't pay? <laughs> that they yeah. have like Major League Baseball took over their TV because Bally didn't pay them. It was them in Arizona. I'm like, there are way shittier teams that like you could have ditched before the like Padres. we'll take the A's, but not the Padres. <laughs> hey, they're in NBC, but I'm thinking like Cleveland. Like, why are we like Kansas oh, City? Yeah. Why are we staying with KC? Because Bobby Wood Jr., have you seen him? Oh, right. Yeah. No, I forgot. He's way better forgot. than than the trio of Machado, Tatis, and Soto. Sorry about that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm <laughs> like, is. <laughs> <laughs> so do you understand where I'm coming from here before we move I on? I do. I do. And like, I'm letting logic get in the way of my thinking on the San Diego Padres. I'm looking at them like the Padres of three years ago, and I shouldn't be doing that. I think the way that I can best comprehend this is they're going to push all the chips in again on the last postseason run they have with Juan Soto on the books. Exactly. They signed up for three off seasons of Juan Soto. Next year is the third. They're going to give it a full go. And then this thing may crash like the Roman Empire pre-2025. And we have another question that we're going to talk about that surrounds tearing down. Okay. But question number two, which teams will surprise people during the postseason? Doesn't necessarily need to be underdogs, but could also be teams proving why they're the best in the league asked yeah. by St Stefan Hammerschmidt on IG apologies if I mispronounce your name I consistently do that because these handles on social media are impossible yeah. Jack who's who's the team that you just you feel it in your loins it's a plums pick this is a plums question because yeah. like we could say like you know who I think is going to be pretty good this postseason the Braves. I could see the Braves being pretty good. How about the Astros, man? They've won a World Series, it seems like, every other year. Oh, you know who's a sneaky team? The Phillies, because they just went to the World Series. Like, who's who's sitting deep in the plums? Uh, one National League team, one American League team. Yep. The Milwaukee Brewers in the National League. I don't think people really understand how good this, this pitching staff is. And Aram had a great bit on Milwaukee becoming a bullpen factory with Yoel Piams and Abner Uribe. Obviously, Devin Williams, you got going on there. They have a billion other dudes, I feel like, with a sub three in that pen. But that front three in the rotation of Burns, Woodruff, and Peralta, there are a lot of national baseball fans that don't watch Freddie Peralta pitch. They'll see the highlights of Corbin Burns on Pitching Ninja. But Woodruff, who was out for the front half of the year, and Peralta now, I think a lot of baseball fans and a lot of like, you know, casuals, and we accept casuals, bring you in, baby. We need more fans. I think they're going to watch Woodruff and Peralta throw for maybe the first time in their lives. And they're going to say, holy smokes, these guys are good. So Milwaukee in the National League, in the American League, it's Wait, Toronto, before, man. Before yeah. you get to the American League, let me let me give you my National League team because I was thinking about the Brewers. And the Brewers, I feel like – like, you're not wrong. I love the answer. I feel like we gave that exact answer last year. We gave that exact an the answer the year before. Like, we just keep sure. saying them because, like, well, they got Burns, Woodruff, Freddy. How are you going to go ag against that? And that answer continues to be right. And then they get in the playoffs and they put up one run. They happen. lose a couple yeah. of straight three-to-one games because – the offense, like Yelich, has slowed down. I don't know if anybody is, but seen he's been that hurt lately. He's missed the last. I know time. he he's he's missed some time, but that's. I mean, he's missed some time. It's September twenty second. Like he's not going to be a full go Christian Yelich MVP that we saw in the beginning of the season. And without him, like the Brewers' offense really dies down. A team that I think could beat them. I don't know if they're going to play them with the exact format. I don't even know if they're going to make the playoffs. I'm willing to be hurt by the Arizona Diamondbacks. I'm willing to be hurt. Let me tell you why. Okay. 
We're talking about a frontline duo. Merrill Kelly is awesome. I don't care. Merrill Kelly continues to turn in six, seven inning performances of one run ball. He's got an ERA in the low threes. And Zach Gallen has had some rougher starts lately, but you get Zach Gallen at Chase Field, he ain't losing. Even that game against the Giants where he gave up four, Diamondback scored eight. Like, they do not lose when Zach Gallen is at home, and they really don't lose when Merrill Kelly is at home. Now, they might have some road games. I understand. It won't be as electric. But still, I think those two guys, you put them up against any other duo, they can win any of those games. Not saying they're better, but they're good enough pitchers to hang in there. The bullpen scares me. But adding Paul Seawald in, Kevin Ginkle has been very good. They have a couple of back-end guys that are good enough that if those two give you length, they can shut the door. The middle part of the bullpen, that's what screwed them over this year. They keep fucking blowing games, and it sucked. But the back-end, I really like the back-end. Then I look across the diamond. Cattell Marte, huge bounce back here. Christian Walker, it, we talk about Haseon Kim being underrated. Yeah. 36 home runs last year, 30 this year, 29 and in 2019 defense. with gold glove defense. Gabriel Moreno is heating up behind the dish. They have such good defense around the field. They're a sneaky team that I think if they played the Brewers, they'd win that series. What do you think? I like that take. I feel like you've changed course on Arizona often, right? Like it every, was every week. Every week, every week, I fully admit it. I buy in so heavy. I mean, our biggest bet here at the Just Baseball Show was Arizona Diamondbacks over 74 and a half wins, yeah. like on yeah. Bet MGM. That was our big, like, you know, like sell the house, sell your grandma, lock of the century, mega nuke. Not actually bet responsibly. It was a 2.2 unit play, our biggest of the year. And because we believed in the hype. And it came true, but then they started sucking. And then you're like, oh, this team is too young. They're just not mature enough yet. These pitchers are not as good as I think. And then they heat up again. I'm like, wait a minute. But they're heating up right at the perfect time, right? Yeah. They just have to heat up now. And if they can carry that momentum into the playoffs, I know they're young. They're immature. I don't think they're going to win the World Series. But the question was a sneaky underdog. And they're my pick in the National League. Okay. Um, yeah, the tone in which I, I say Ryan Nelson, I think, summarizes the Arizona Diamondbacks. Like, ah, at the beginning yeah. of the year, Ryan Nelson. In the middle of the year, Ryan Nelson. Ryan Nelson. And now I'm like, Ryan Nelson? Ryan Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I think it's the tone in which you say Ryan Nelson that has kind of encapsulated what the Diamondbacks have done. I love that you bring up Gabby Moreno. Because uh, this guy has solidified himself as one of the better young catchers in baseball. And, and this was a great 30-game sample pull from Aram on X. He posted it on X. Shout out, Elon. Shout out, Elon. Uh, last, <laughs> last 30 games, Gabby Moreno slashing 343, 404, 560. It's a 159 WRC plus, 15% K rate. Um, Gabby Moreno... If if it was clicking offensively, this guy is amazing. He's one of the better defensive catchers in the game. And, and the fact that he can hit the ball all around the ballpark and he's hitting for a little bit more power now, I think the concern has always kind of been, will you tap into juice? He's not tapping into 25 homer juice, but he's tapping into doubles and a huge ballpark juice. Um, man, I, I can get on board with it, and they're just a fun watch every night. I can turn them on every night and enjoy myself. And I'm excited to watch them on national television. Give me a weakness. Lordy Scurriel Jr. in left field has been a stud this year. Also, that trade, bar show for... Yeah, Bar-Show, amazing. It has not worked very well for the Blue Jays. I think they'll be fine. I still love bar show. We're going to talk about them later, actually. Yeah. That trade, at least for this season, is going extremely well for the Diamondbacks. Corbin Carroll in the center, one of the best players in Major League Baseball. You got Jake McCarthy in right field, who is has the worst arm I've ever seen from a right fielder. However, he can get to any ball, and he's at least this nice. cool, slappy ninth hitter. Like, he's okay. Yeah. And Geraldo Perdomo is still fine. He's not great, but he's not bad. Emmanuel Rivera at third is fine not bad. like these Former are weaknesses Royal. they're just not great players can tell Marte has been a stud Christian Walker's been a stud Gabby Moreno and then you got the two studs at the top and a decent back end like there's a recipe here 
and they'll get, they're just going to run havoc on teams. Yeah, the weakness is game three. Yeah, the weakness that's the weakness. Three. They probably don't win game three, but I'm saying if they win one and two, like they're they're probably going to win the series. I hope so. Maybe but the not. Weakness, but the weakness but, is game three, and we'll yeah, see how Gallon the, feels on super short rest. They're not going to win the World Series, but they no, might. But they're sneaky. Seed crazier. Um, American League. I I do have a, a sleeper in the American League, and it, I don't know if you want to consider them a sleeper, but Toronto is my sleeper in the American League because they have gotten here in a different way. Um, I think we were expecting them to have the best offense in baseball. They have not been that. But what Toronto has done is put together the third best, or no, um, the second best staff ERA in baseball. Milwaukee was third. Seattle is first. Toronto is second. The fact that they are doing this in spite of Alec Manoa going through the year that he went through is so commendable. And I feel like I said that last month. I feel like I said that last week. But it, the way I know you guys talked about the Yusei Kikuchi 13 hours of sleep thing. If my three starters getting 13 hours of sleep before a wild card start, I feel really good, really good. Um, Barrios has turned it on Iron this Man. year. I love this bounce back from Barrios. Me too. Gosman is just consistently one of the best pitchers in baseball. That dude, that dude. And Bassett, man, Bassett starting game four, if they do get to a CS, like, all right, sure. Not on the road, please. Okay, but Romano on the back end, Hicks on the back end. Like, yeah. there are enough guys there. And, and the fact that the complementary pieces in the lineup are doing enough with an underwhelming Vladdy, and, you know, Bichette is still Bo Bichette. Like, I think Toronto, in a, in a way that nobody was expecting, is a really dangerous postseason team. I have a very interesting relationship with the Toronto Blue Jays. Is Vladdy's hurt? Yes. And it screwed me. Just what a dagger to the heart. Yeah, I'm but sorry. More importantly, looking at the Blue Jays over these past couple of years, it all makes so much sense. And it still doesn't happen. I agree. They're the second wildcard team as we're speaking today. They just beat the brakes off the Yankees. They should be the team and they should be the answer. However, I'm standing pat on what I've said over the past three years of doing this show. They got to show me. They got to show me. They just get there or they don't get there and they just fall flat. There's something there. And I really think they are managed by quite possibly the worst manager in Major League Baseball. I think John Schneider has no idea what he is doing. And I think he has screwed them time over time. Lineup decisions, resting guys when they should be in the lineup, bullpen decisions. I think he's a real problem. I do. Because you look at the team, there's so much talent. They're like first in these advanced metrics in the bullpen. They're top five in the starting rotation. They have Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Bo Bichette and George Springer and Matt Chapman. Team should win more games than they do. Yeah. I'll believe it when I see it. Okay. That's my thoughts on the Blue Jays. But again, prove me wrong. Watching the Blue Jays when they're playing good baseball is some of the best baseball in the yeah. league. When yeah. they're firing on all cylinders, they could win the World Series. They that, are that, foghorn, that Foghorn and Rogers Center man in the postseason, nothing electric. gets quite like that thing. Electric. So I'm rooting for them because if they're good, baseball is better. Oh, yeah. I just got to see it. Yeah, I got to see it before I buy it. <laughs> You're just and not that patriotic. <laughs> no, I'm so <laughs> patriotic that I'm anti-Canada. <laughs> Here's my team. This team is in first place. But I don't hear discourse around them when it pertains to winning the World Series. I just hear how great of a story they are. How exciting they've been in the regular season. But you know what? They still got issues. They're still young. Why can't the Baltimore Orioles win the World Series this year? Why can't they? Talk about a team who I'm seeing it with my very eyes. They just went into Houston and dogged on them. 
Houston's pretty damn good. Houston had to just keep a hold of their first place because of a walk-off win by Mauricio Dubon. I watched that series. The Orioles were better than they were. The Orioles are also, I would say, getting hot at the right time, but they've just been fucking on fire all year. Whenever they play teams above 500, they dominate. It, whether It's on the road, it's at home, and we say, well, do they have the starting pitching to match? It doesn't matter. They just hit to overcome it. They're great at every position. They have, I think, at this point, like how is Adley Rutschman not the best leader behind the dish in Major League Baseball? I mean, how is he not? He Everything is. we hear from every single starting pitcher is Adley is different. They've never and, been swept with Adley Rutschman like, on the roster. There is something there. There yeah. is something that you just cannot quantify that when the going gets tough, the Baltimore Orioles fucking show up. That's how I and feel I about Yasmani Grandal. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. When I look at the starting rotation, I'm looking at G-Rod, who is just a train engine heading to hell. Like, <laughs> he made a deal with the devil because that change that he made, and I obviously he didn't make a deal with the devil, but you know what I'm saying. Like, the, since he got called back up, he is just on another level. Kyle Bradish is a stud. Yeah. He's just amazing. He went into Houston. And he hasn't even, I think he allowed like one run against Houston in like 24 innings. I don't yeah, even know the stats. 22 and a third and one run or something. Dominated them. Then you look at the bullpen. They got Shintaro Fujinami, who looks like the best reliever in Major League Baseball. Felix Bautista has gone down. They haven't missed a beat. It hasn't even mattered. This team needs to be square in the center when we talk about World Series teams. And they're not. We're like, ooh, the Rays are a sneaky team. They've been to five playoff appearances and have done nothing. If we're talking about, oh, the Orioles don't have the starting pitching, who, who says they do? Who says they do? Who says Tampa does? Who says Tampa does? We give Tampa the benefit of the doubt in that department. But they don't deserve it come playoff time, regular season. They're awesome. Why should we give them any credit for anything they've ever done in the postseason? Mm, because they got to the World Series in 20. In 20 and lost. Bro, that shit they took out Blake Snell. Wow. Then I look at the Astros. Like, the Astros are great. They have But, like, everybody issues. expects them to go to the World Series. Like, when Everyone they get in, oh, we got Houston. Like, see ya. <laughs> and we've <laughs> just been, right. we've just been glued to the meat of the Mariners all year, courtesy of me. Meat glue. Meat glue. <laughs> The Rangers, like, I just, I, they, they make my head hurt because they put up 15 against the Red Sox, and you're like, they're back. So they, Lose, then you're the like, Ra oh. you know what the Rangers are going to be? The Rangers are going to be the 2021 Boston Red Sox where they piss me off to no end, and they're still <laughs> going to go to the ALCS. Yeah, they'll probably still be good, but I just like, I can't, I can't anymore. I keep, like, I just, I can't get a read on you. I know, I know I what can't. you're doing. <laughs> I have no idea what to expect from them. At their peak, they could win the World Series. At their low, they won't even make the playoffs. Then I look at the Twins. The Cray injury sucks. The Royce Lewis injury sucks. I think they have great pitching. But again, another manager who I do not trust. I do not trust Rocco Baldelli in the Really? Playoffs. I don't at all. He just, had, he just had twin boys. Uh, I think Enzo and Nino Baldelli. Congratulations. Those Congratulations, are Italiano Rocco. names. I, I hope he carries over some of that good energy into the playoffs. But as we sit here today, I do not trust him. I don't trust the Blue Jays, even though I know they're great, but I still don't trust them. I trust two teams, the Astros and the Orioles. And everyone already has the Astros getting in. I trust the Baltimore Orioles. I think they have a great shot of winning the World Series. Especially when Jack Flaherty throws the eighth inning for them. Um, but he's like been, like, I don't think he's allowed to run out of the bullpen yet. I know it's been like a couple of minutes. He just moved. Yeah, he, he yeah, just he, like, But then he, he's had two outings. still got cardboard boxes in the living room, Bubba. Like, I, I, watched, <laughs> I watched his last outing at the bullpen. Did allow a run. <laughs> like, the Orioles do this. Yeah. Yeah, I I like it, man. I like it. I like how fired up you got. I'm I'm I've been fired up this whole episode. I've had plenty of caffeine and I'm ready to roll. Question number three: Who are some guys that you think can make the biggest impact in the postseason that some people might not fully expect? Example: Howie Kendrick in 2019, asked by Maximus Freed on Twitter. I have an answer for you. 
talking about shower thoughts. So funny you brought that up because in the shower today, I had a vision. Game three, Arizona Diamondbacks. Runners on first and third. They're down 3-2. Christian Walker steps up, steps up to the plate mm-hmm. and just does what he's been doing when nobody's been watching. Now, I have a real answer, but I wanted to tell you my vision. And I had that vision. The Diamondbacks are going to make the playoffs, and Christian Walker is going to hit a big-time home run to win them a series. I'll give I like you my that. real answer after you give your answer, but I had a vision. I yeah, I I like that. I like that you isolated one guy, and I love the question. The example was tough for me because Howie Kendrick didn't really come out of nowhere. Like Howie Kendrick in nineteen hit three forty and had a nine seventy OPS. That's the thing. It's just like on that Nats team. On that, yeah, he was he was an afterthought because you had you know Turner and you had Rendon and you had Strasburg and you had Scherzer and oh, Pat no. Corbin was good. Soto, yeah, shit. Yeah. I think he was twenty years old at the time. He turned twenty one during the postseason. He was like the best player on that team that year. Um, I kind of went a different route, and I took that as like, okay, guys that really have not had a chance to showcase it that can, and I went rookie heavy. Hmm. Um. I did say Will Smith, but James Outman, the guy that initially came to mind in the National League, because he may hit a 470 foot homer and people are going to be like, who's the dude with the curly hair? And it's like, oh, he was a rookie this year. You know what? James Outman has a higher war this year than Michael Harris. 3.9 3.9 F4 for James Outman compared to James Outman is tooled out, bro. We've been talking about him, man. Um, The American League are, are the guys that I love. How can you see this question and not think about Davis Schneider? <laughs> like he just might be the one. Um, but I do think that this could be huge for the tandem of Edward Julien and Royce Lewis. Mm. Those two are slept on in Minnesota. And I know that Aram has said, like, get ready to watch Royce Lewis. And I think Aram actually identified Lewis as a guy in the postseason, but I'm telling you to look at Julien, man. This guy has the the quietest 870 OPS in baseball we've got this year. He's not getting any rookie of the year love, but man, put him in the batter's box in a in a high leverage moment, he's going to walk or he's going to hit a ball really hard. And that ball might get over a fence. I'm a huge Julian guy, and I think if the Twins are going to make noise, it's not going to come from Correa obviously. It's not going to come from Buxton. Give me Lewis with a big homer and give me Julianne to be the guy that impresses like nobody else over the course of a five game series. I think it's a phenomenal answer. My only, it's not even about Julian because I think that's a great one. Do you think Royce is going to be good to go come postseason time? I hope so. Um, and I hope he gets to hit with the bases loaded because he's better than Barry Bonds yeah. on crack. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I like, I, I, I really hope so. Um, Another guy, real quick, a pitcher. Brian Abreu might just not allow a base runner. Yeah. Like, remember how dominant he was last postseason? And I just could see him doing that again. But Julian, Julian is my guy. If I had to ID one guy, it's Julian. Brian Abreu is a bad man. He's a bad man. I, I love him. I love him too. He's on my he's on my fantasy baseball team. I'm actually in the championship right now. Congratulations. Uh, subtle flex. I have two guys. And they revolve around my Orioles take. Because I don't think, if you don't watch Orioles baseball consistently, you you probably, you know about Gunner, you know about Adley, you know about some of these guys. But do you know about Anthony Santander? Do you know about Austin Hayes? Like, these are guys in the Orioles lineup that hit third and sixth and fifth. And it's like, oh, like, he's up at the plate, but he's not Cedric Mullins. He's not Adley. He's not Gunner. But these are the guys that I feel make the Orioles run. Like when we talk about why I love the Rangers is how deep they are in their lineup, that there's no breaks. It's great when you have a top of the lineup that's amazing. But what makes good teams great is guys like this. Austin Hayes, who was an all-star, and I feel like nobody gives a shit. And Anthony Santander. Anthony Santander this year has 27 home runs with an 800 OPS. 
at 28 years old. This is a really good player that nobody cares about. I think in the postseason, when everyone turns on these Orioles games, expecting to see the big hit from Adley, expecting to see it from Gunner, expecting to see it from Cedric, it's Anthony Santander who makes the sprinklers gr- gr- ugh, who makes the sprinklers grow. No, blow. You no. know what I mean. Yeah, He's going to make bat. everyone spit water out of their mouth. Yeah, gotcha. I couldn't gotcha. sound it out, but everybody knows what I'm talking about here. <laughs> I think Anthony Santander is that guy, and my another guy on that team who I also love, who I just think is such a gritty, good baseball player, is Austin Hayes. I think those guys are going to make a big impact this postseason because they're yeah, also yeah. they're the older guys. They've been around a little bit longer, right? They don't have the postseason experience. But I don't think the the bright lights are going to shine too bright on guys like that. Yeah. So I will say the uh, the Cedric Mullins three run homer in Houston earlier this week kind of gave me postseason vibes and like. But I feel like everybody that expects that to happen. Yeah, like I think expect Cedric to be great. Right. Yeah. So I I guess I do like the Santander answer. I think that's good because. You know, no matter which side he's on, I could see him just flirting with a foul pole, right? Just drilling a ball as a lefty bat down the right field line, and it's second deck, and yeah, people go ballistic. I I've can totally see it so many see times. It. I've seen it so many times. Dude so hits many. tanks. He has twenty-seven bombs. I like it. Question number four. Yep. Get after it. Okay. Make a starting nine lineup only using players who hit seven through nine in their team's lineup. Asked by Mengel Ethan on Twitter. This is a great one. And when I was going through trying to make my team, I had to cheat a little bit because there are certain positions on the field, like first base, like right field, that if you hit seven through ninth, you're ass. <laughs> like, so I kind of cheated at some positions. And then I didn't want to make it so Braves heavy because realistically I can put their seven through nine just on this team. Yeah. And I try not to add a bunch of Dodgers, even though of course we kind of have to, but let's go position by position. Who was catcher for you? Another really tough one in my opinion. Yeah. So I looked at lineups from Tuesday and Wednesday and I plucked from those. Sean Murphy hit seventh for Atlanta on Wednesday. So Murphy's my catcher. See, I was like, I the answer was Murphy, but I was like, Hal Raleigh did hit eighth and seventh this year. Right. <laughs> this year. Yeah. I, I went on the last two days before I this. Know. I was and like, that's cool. We'll have different time. answers here because I did full season of like who hit seventh and eighth and ninth this year. At least they they count. Because yeah. What, like, do you want me to start Austin Hedges? Jason DeLay? No. <laughs> no, but like Murphy's here. <laughs> you no, don't Murphy's have to start Jason DeLay he when Murphy's seventh, here. But he did fourth on any other team. So, yes, we'll go with Murphy's Sean Murphy. <laughs> it's technically, you're not cheating. He I'm hit seventh. Cheating. He hit seventh on Wednesday. What about first base? Uh, I cheated a little bit here, but um, Hunter Goodman played right on on Wednesday. He played first base on Tuesday. So I went Hunter Goodman. He hit seventh on Tuesday and uh, played first base. I went with the Rocky rookie, Hunter Goodman. He's terrible. No, he's not. He's got 30 and 100 back-to-back years in the minor leagues. In the minor leagues? In that league? Bro. That league that is built on the moon? Where Stone Garrett hit like 50 bombs? <laughs> Hunter Goodman is hitting 233 with a 720 OPS in his first 19 big league games. Played with the Rockies at Coors Field. Between low A, high A, and 12 games in double in 22, he hit 295 with 36 and 106 driven in. And this year, between double A and 15 games in triple A, double A is a tough place to hit. 34 homers and 111 driven in. How about my answer, who hits seventh a decent amount? Alec Bohm? Sure. Doesn't okay. even play a lot of first base, though, so that's totally cheating because he's moved up in the lineup because he's been good. But, like, he he hit seventh and eighth this year. That happened. Philly's I also firm. That happened. I also think Votto hit seventh for the Reds on Wednesday, so we could go Joey Votto. What do you want to do? I think Bohm's better. Yeah, I do think Bohm is better. Let's go Bohm. Let's go Bohm. Second base. This was easy. Who do you have? Do you want me to say mine? Yeah. 
Tommy Edmond. I mean, I'm taking that defense. Like, he is sure. Like, sure. Do you have any other answers? Yeah, Tyro Estrada hit ninth on Wednesday. Oh, true. He did hit ninth on Wednesday. I always see him leading off. I didn't think of him. But I would still take Edmund. I know he's having a good year, but like Tommy Edmund is still an all-world defender at multiple positions. I know we can't hit this year. I know, but he hit last year. It's not like he just sucks now. I'm taking Edmund still. Ah, Shrod is a good answer for this year. That'd be the answer for this year, but like Edmund hits ninth. Like we need a ninth hitter. This is a what have you done for me lately game, man. Tyro Estrada is my guy. I think that's fair. Third base. Another easy one for me because it was really the only good player who's hit seventh and eighth this year. Um, I cheated a teensy bit and I put Christopher Morrell at third base. See, I put Heiber Candelario. I know he's hurt now, but he was hitting <laughs> seventh and eighth. He, do you, sure. know an, you know, as an eighth hitter, he has a 1100 OPS. He's five for eight. Sweet. He has eight plate appearances <laughs> in the eight hole. Sweet. Um, yeah, Morell hit seventh on Wednesday. Morell doing a lot of DHing right now when he yeah, does he play, play the third. But like he has a good bit and like right. Yeah, I'll slap him at third bit. It was either third, second, or center, and no shot he's cracking my outfield. My outfield's gas. My outfield's honestly, I feel like you found a better outfield than me because I don't feel like my outfield's that good. It's pretty good. It's not great. Left oh, field. Who you got? Uh, are we doing shortstop? What's the word? Oh, I just completely forgot shortstop. Yes, I have two answers. And the only reason I have two answers is just I felt like we were going to add so many Braves. The obvious answer here is Orlando Arcia. It's ninth. He was an all-star. He's on the Braves. He's amazing. Ellie freaking De La Cruz hit eighth on Wednesday. I want Ellie. <laughs> I've we're going to talk about Ellie more. We're gonna I have talk a rookie about. who's been better. Anthony Volpe. Has he been better? 2020 played every day to win guy he's been better he's been better anthony volpe has had a good rookie season people forget he's 21 are you sure he's had a good rookie season for a rookie playing shortstop in yankee stadium he's had a good season i know it's 2020 but he's hitting 208 with a 670 ops yeah there's been some good things and some bad things Bobby Wood Jr. was not that far off from that exact stat line. I'm not saying he's going to become Bobby Wood Jr. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just saying as a really young player with the pressures of Yankee Stadium playing that position, which I think outside of maybe like quarterback, shortstop for the New York Yankees is the most pressure-driven position in baseball. And he played as a 21-year-old and won 2020. That doesn't happen in rookie years. I think it's a good season. For a rookie, context included. Yeah. Shortstop for the Yankees is probably the most pressure-packed position in baseball. I was going to ask you if you've ever, you know, tried to empathize with the goaltender for the San Jose Sharks, but not the case. I tried. Didn't work. Netminder. You think Volpe's fair? I mean, RC is the answer. RC is the answer. Yeah. I I don't know. I'm Team Ellie over Team Volpe, but we're going to get into the Ellie conversation. We will. Left field. This was easy. I don't care how bad Varsho has been. I'm choosing him. Really? Okay. Uh, I'm choosing Chaz McCormick. Yeah. Damn it. Yeah, that's the answer. <laughs> that's the answer. But no, that's the answer. I. That's the answer. Let's move on to center. <laughs> that's just <laughs> that's that's the better answer. <laughs> center field couldn't decide. Michael Harris or James Altman? Take your pick. Uh, I put Altman in right. I've got Harris in center. Okay, that's fair. In right field, I completely cheated, but technically he hit seventh, like a couple times. Teoscar Who? Hernandez. Ah, no, doesn't count. <laughs> doesn't count. Uh, Harris in center, Outman in right. My DH, Nick Castellanos hit seventh on Wednesday. <laughs> give that me was that. Fun. That was fun. Yeah, give me that beast. All right, let's keep moving on. We got more questions. Now let's talk about Ellie. Is Ellie De La Cruz going to pan out like we thought he would? Asked by Full Count Baseball on Twitter. He has not been good. Like, below 700 OPS. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. The approach sucks. He swings and misses so much. But then he shows you flashes of what looks like the most talented freak I've ever seen. 
but over the full game, it's not good, Jack. It's not good. He's It's early. Of course, we're not overreacting. Still think he's going to be a good player. Rookies go through pitfalls. Happens all the time. But my main issue with him, you know what his worst pitch to hit against is? Shit. Is it fastballs? Fastballs. Yeah. He's hitting 228 against fastballs. I thought he was hitting like 210 against breaking pitches. Maybe against overall breaking pitches. But when I look at each pitch over a full sample, he has a negative four run value against fastballs. That's worse than any other pitch that he hits. Six run value against cutters. Fucking crushes cutters. Has not been hitting fastballs this year, which I think is a big problem. It's kind of like when we look at a rookie pitcher and your fastball is getting tattooed. It's very hard to be a good pitcher without a good fastball. It's, it's really hard to be a good hitter without hitting fastballs. His swing is really long. I think his approach stinks at the plate, but sometimes he's so lightning quick that he just smacks a ball and then runs it for a triple. And we post the highlights because it's visually so appealing. It is like everybody on uh, Twitter, like, I see you. I get it. When we post an Elliot highlight, you're like, well, he struck out the other day. <laughs> Congratulations. We all watched the game. We know. But the highlight itself is just so awesome that we're going to post it. So shut up. Jesus. But he has not been good. Okay. Um, I'm busting out a, a lowercase x. Um, wow. Expected slug. Okay. On pitches up and middle of the zone for Ellie de la Cruz, 149. Bad. Very bad. Terrific. Why is he getting beaten by fastballs? Because he's a big, long human being, and it's hard to catch up to elevated stuff. Yep. That's how that works. Um, I am not worried about Ellie de la Cruz because I think we've been very – transparent about needing to ride the roller coaster with this guy and in the minor leagues like he was always better than each stop this is the first time probably in his baseball life that he hasn't been better than everybody that he sees what happens there you, you get beaten and people panic like that's what happened with bobby witt right like witt i mean i, I wanted to compare rookie seasons between ellie and bobby witt and the Bro, big Volpe difference, in there too. Uh, if you have Volpe's numbers, go ahead. But okay. I wanted to compare Ellie and Bobby Witt. Ellie has an 80 WRC plus. Witt had a 98 WRC plus. And I was like, okay, wh where's the big difference here? Because Ellie's chasing at a 36% clip, which is incredibly high. Bobby Witt was chasing at a 37% clip. Ellie's OBP is under 200 at 297. Bobby Witt's was under 200. 300. What? You said under 200, under, under 300, 300 yeah. under 300. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Ellie De La Cruz is seeing 38% of opposing pitches in the strike zone. That's a very low number. They know he's going to swing and miss outside the strike zone. Bobby Witt saw 40%, which is still a very low number. I think the biggest factor here is Ellie has a 34% K rate and Bobby Witt had a 20% K rate. 15% margin there is massive. Like Ellie's striking out left and right. Bobby Witt, at least he was like putting a one pitches in play. Um, the other thing that kind of jumps out to me is the isolated power is incredibly low. He's got a 166 ISO. It's the lowest, I think, at any stop at his career, regardless of level. There might have been a stop at rookie ball or, or in short season ball or something where he had a lower one. But it's it's the strikeouts and it's the lack of consistent pop that is a teensy bit worrisome, but I frankly can't get worried yet because this guy might just be getting acclimated this year. Like, let's talk next All-Star break, to be totally honest. He's also a switch hitter where one of the sides of the plate is horrible. 773 OPS against right-handed pitching. He has not been bad, yeah, right? But so... His overall slash line this year is 231, 297, 397 against right handed pitching, who he faces more often than not, right? He has 251 at bats versus 104 at bats against lefties. 
251, 323, 450 with a 773 OPS against right-handed pitching. Versus lefties, 183, 234, 269. He might not be a switch hitter, right? I don't know. He's early, right? We got to remember, 21 years old, same age as Dylan Cruz. Like, let's put context in this. <laughs> same we age have as- to. He's yeah. same age as Langford. Like, we have to remind yeah, ourselves. But Langford's OPSing 1,100 if he's in the big leagues this year. We know yeah, that. Exactly. No, we don't know that. That's <laughs> We the thing. know that. I know. We know. I already saw it. I, yeah. I actually, I know it. Like, we know it. <laughs> but <laughs> seriously, De La Cruz has issues hitting lefties, cannot hit from the right side of the plate, and is striking out an insane amount. Can he fix those issues? Yeah. I think so. He's just too talented for us to count him out. Ready to move on? Yeah. Number six. Should the Braves be worried about their pitching staff going into the playoffs with how bad they've been in September? Asked by Falcons Kraken on Twitter. This is some slight. Shout out some slight. He's on our Twitch stream all the time from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. Eastern where we uh, go over all the games of the day and make our picks and stuff on Twitch at just baseball fans. Shout out. I'm going to make this one quick. No. No, like kind of, but no. Is Strider going to be good? Yes. Is Freed going to be good? Yes. And then you just need a good outing here and there from Morton, from Elder, or from Kyle Wright, who have all been shaky in their own rights, but they just hit. And their bullpen, I still think, is good. Now, Brad Hand keeps coming in. He ain't <laughs> getting postseason appearances. Believe me, he ain't. The good bullpen arms are in there, and they get a good start, a quality start from their guy. They're probably going to win the game. So, like, yes, is there a crack in the armor in Atlanta? Yes. Could it end up hurting them in the postseason? Of course, it's baseball. Like, anything can happen. But am I going into the playoffs being like, hey, I'm picking the Braves to lose because I don't like their starting rotation. Absolutely not. Yeah. If there is any manager in baseball that is going to put Brad Hand in the postseason in like the seventh inning of a one-run game because he's a grizzled vet, it is snit. (laughs) But like we know Brad Hand's going to be really good (laughs) if that happens. He's the one guy. Like Brian Snickers, like, yeah, it was just a gut feel thing. Felt it in my loins. (laughs) Yeah, it's outside the opposite. It's like Brad Hand's. You know, ex Woba versus this guy is, is not good. Please don't put it in. And Snit's, Snit's like, you know, no, I feel it. <laughs> you know no. what? <laughs> He'll get what? him. Yeah. <laughs> He'll get him. Just go. And then he'll get him. Like, that's how Snit works. Um, that's why everybody, you got to watch these episodes on YouTube. Jack and I are just <laughs> doing all these different antics and shit. For, uh, for context, Max Freed, 18 innings in September, four earned. That's a two ERA. Uh, other guys, September splits. Bryce Elder has a four and a half, 21 hits, 10 walks in 21 and two thirds. Charlie Morton has a seven and a half, 14 and two thirds, 18 hits, 12 walks. That whip is astronomical right now. Spencer Strider, 16 and two thirds, 14 hits, 10 earned. Kyle Wright, seven innings, 11 hits, 10 earned. I he think did. four homers. And he's working back from in. Right. I just don't yeah, know if he's going to actually really... pitch in the postseason. Yeah, and if you guys are listening every day, you know you've heard me mention that that right. Like, I just don't think you can trust this guy to take the ball in the postseason right now because he doesn't look healthy. Like a healthy Kyle Wright is a different story, but this is not a healthy Kyle Wright, and I I feel like that's pretty clear. Um, Wright doesn't look right. Yeah, it, with a W. It, if anybody's going to hunker down and do the Brian Snitker thing on the hill, it's Charlie Morton. Uh, Morton's <laughs> Chuck Chuck Nasty's going to start games. We know that. Uh, Strider is going to be good. Freed game one, Strider game two, Morton game three, uh, and Elder game four. Sure. Why not with that offense? Don't be worried. Next question. I, like, I get it. They're not a perfect team. This is the, this is not a perfect rotation. However, I said the word perfect, right? Yeah. They're not a perfect team. That's the chink in their armor. Am I worried that that's going to be their downfall? If they do lose, I think that would be their downfall. But I'm not going into the postseason that worried. Yeah. Last question. Mm -hmm. Who in the next two to three years are potential rebuild slash teardown candidates 
that maybe people wouldn't necessarily think of right now? Asked by Tommy underscore H-O-N-E on Twitter. This is a good one. Got two. Tell me. Two American League teams. Hmm. Toronto and Houston. Mm. Can I walk you through the thinking? Yes, please. Start with Toronto. They're going to have to start paying people. Chris Bassett's going to make $22 million in 2025. Springer's going to make 24. Gosman 23. Barrios, 19. Bichette, 17 in his final year of an arbitration expense, extension. This is all in 2025. Vladdy's going to be in his fourth year of arbitration. He's a super two guy. Romano will be in his final arb year. Varsho in his third of four arb years. Kirk in his second of three arb years. 2026 is when they're going to have to start paying people. You can't pay all those guys, especially when you have this type of money locked up in Bassett, this type of money locked up in Springer long-term. Barrios is escalating. I think you're going to have to start picking and choosing and I think one of Bichette and Vladdy is going to walk. And that's going to be tough. And and what is this offense when you don't have both Bichette and Vladdy at their best? And you're paying an older and maybe ailing George Springer at that time. So I am worried Romano's going to walk. I don't think they pay that closer. Um, I don't know. It's weird, man. They might just have a lot of old expensive guys in 2026 and 7. I don't mean to do this. But my answer was also the Blue Jays. So when I went, hmm, I didn't think of the Astros. So that's what I'm really, but I had the same stuff loaded up. And then my question to you when I gave my answer was, what would you pay Vladdy? At at this point, I'm riding out arbitration with him. Absolutely. I've got two more arb years. I'm just, I'm seeing that and I'm letting him hit the open market. And I'll be like, hey, if you loved it, we'll give you a competitive offer. He's a one win player this year. Uh-huh. That's terrible. Blue Jays fans telling me about all the defensive improvements done to get better. No, no, <laughs> no, no. He's stinky. <laughs> no. Offensively. Ugh. <laughs> Bichette's that dude. Bichette's that dude. I think they extend Bichette and they let Vladdy walk after her. I agree. So the Blue Jays was my answer. I can think of another one off the top of my head, but let me hear about the Astros. Houston owes Justin Verlander 43.3 next year. Bregman 30.5. Altuve 29 in his final year of control. Bregman next year at 30.5 is his final year of control. Verlander has 35 million investing in a player option in 25 if he throws 140 innings next year. He will opt into that so freaking quickly. So that's 35 committed right there for 2025. They've got $19.5 million tied up in Jose Abreu in 2025. They have $18 million tied up in Lance McCullers in 25 and 26. Who knows what Lance McCullers looks like when he comes back. Framber Valdez and Kyle Tucker both end arbitration after the 2025 season. Luis Garcia, Chaz McCormick, Brian Abreu after the 2026 season. Mm. Not to mention they have 11 and a half tied up in Rafael Montero. Mm. They timed it up really well. And we haven't worried about it. We're not going to worry about it in 23. Thought may creep into your mind with Tucker and Fromber in 24. But 2025, that's their contract year, man. Like they can walk after the 25 season. So you've got Verlander at 43 years old that you're going to be paying over $30 million to if he throws 140 innings. You've got... You know, Bregman may be coming back in a rework deal that'll be expensive. It'll be a high AAV deal. You're not getting Jose Altuve for $8 million. Come on, let's be frank. Like, you're going to get him for 25 or 30 AAV. Dude, they may run out of money. You're right. Wow. I didn't even think about it. Mm -hmm. I just assumed. It's the Astros. The best thing they did for themselves was locking Framber Valdez up on that escalating deal. And he's been awesome this year. Or no, not Framber, uh, Jordan Alvarez on that escalating year. But Framber's off the books after the 2025 season, along with Kyle Tucker. Someone's going to give Tucker a fucking bag. $300 million. Yep. Everyone's going to be like, really? Yeah, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Mm. Here's one that I don't think is going to happen because there's such a big market. And I always feel that they're going to continue to spend to remain competitive. But I thought about the Phillies. Now, the Blue Jays were my answer. And also, for everybody listening, you have to remember, the question is, like, teams who are very good right now. Like, could the Pirates tear it down again? Sure. Could the, you know, like, we're trying to choose teams who are in the playoffs right now or in the hunt. So that's why you're hearing maybe your favorite team and thinking to yourself, what do you mean tear it down? We're amazing. We're looking three years into the future. And we may be completely wrong, but we're given our best shot of some of the best teams that could potentially enter a rebuild. We see it all the time. Now, Harper's locked up, but he's on the wrong side of 30. Trey Turner is locked up, wrong side of 30. Are they going to re-sign Wheeler? JT Romuto, 33-year-old catcher next year. He's locked up now. How's that going to go? Castellanos, wrong side of 30. Schwarber, wrong side of 30. Tywin Walker, Aaron Nola. Reese Hoskins, who's going to come back, but still wrong side of 30 in arbitration right now. I look at a lot of their team, and if the guys over 30 years old that are tied up in big-time contracts or are free agents soon, they don't have a good farm, and their young core is Marsh and Stott. And Phillies fans, I can already hear you. What about Johan Rojas? He's actually been really, really good lately. But let's be real with each other. Like Bohm, Stott, Marsh. And you're still going to have a couple of your big guns, but they're going to be on the older end. And what does Dombrowski do? Dombrowski comes into teams. He spends all of your money. He'll get you to World Series. And then he leaves. I guarantee you, when he signed the Trey Turner deal, he knew he wasn't going to be there at the end of it. That's for another GM to deal with. It's kind of like in politics. When a president runs up the debt and then leaves it to another president, I think we've seen that in every administration in the history of the United States. Yeah, That's what Dombrowski is. He's a debt riser. <laughs> I think the Phillies could be due for a rebuild. The reason I picked the Blue Jays over them is because the Blue Jays aren't this huge market that's known for spending big amounts of dollars. The Phillies just are. But they would be my team in the National League. Yeah. I think they're like, they've accepted their fate at this point. Like 25 is really the last year. Do you think they, do you think they make an effort to re-sign Nola? Would you? I don't think so. For the price point that he'll be at in this diluted pitcher's market, I don't think I would. I wouldn't either. I mean, but, like, he's still good, I think. <laughs> he's – he. I hate him, but I love him. I hate him so much that I love him. No, I love him so much that I hate him. I hate him. Have you made up your mind yet? No. Um, he's it's always going to give you – It's been years. He's always going to give you a ton mind. of innings. Always. Yeah. He is Iron Man-esque, but he's got a four-and-a-half ERA in his walk here. He's allowed 31 homers. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I would say, hey, man, we'll we'll give you five for 115. But if you demand more than that, like, we'll see you. Look forward to the tribute video. <laughs> do you think the Phillies make sense, though, within this question? I do. Um, yeah, I th- I think they're one that. I think people probably do see the writing on the wall, but they choose to ignore it. Um, it's fine because they're competitive right now. If if I was a fan of the yeah. Phillies, I would completely ignore it because they're still going to be great next year. Yeah. And this year, 2025, it starts to get a little dicey in Philly. Yeah. And that'll so, do it for this episode of the Just Baseball Show. Full week of episodes. Hopefully you guys all enjoyed it. And if you did, hit the like button on YouTube, please. How about the subscribe button? It's a big red button. And, and guess what? doesn't cost you nothing, and it just helps us give you all the free content every single weekday. How about rating and reviewing on Spotify, Apple Podcasts? Come on. Why not? 
Go Why ahead. not? Five stars, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Get yourself some Just Baseball merch. I'm rocking the hat. I'm rocking the tee, the athletic tee. It's nice. I love it. Make sure to get yours in the episode description. Again, it just helps out our company, right? Really appreciate you guys all listening. We'll be back on Monday. That's Jack. I'm Peter. And with that, thank you, everybody.